Greetings, friends of astrobiology. Welcome to our brand new episode of Ask an Astrobiologist, a show where we celebrate science and celebrate science from home. My name is Sanjay Sum, and this program is made possible by contributions from the NASA Astrobiology Program and a nonprofit, Blue Marble Space. We live in unsettling times. I think all of you, like me, are sheltering at home, concerned about ourselves, our families, our loved ones, and our broader community. But perhaps for the first time in a long time, this broader community has included the entire planet. It doesn't matter who you believe in, doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, doesn't matter what language you speak, we're all in this together, floating in this blue marble in the vastness of space. But there are two elements of humanity that bring me hope today, one of which has been the incredible strength of compassion I've seen coming out from everybody around the world. That has been really uplifting. The second has been the strength of the scientific voice in implementing change that would help us all overcome this pandemic. And so it's, it's in the spirit of science that we have this show, and we are very excited today to host Dr. Colin Goldblatt from the University of Victoria to chat with us about the magic of his science. But first, it's time for the competition that was formerly known as the background quiz. Last Friday, my wonderful colleague Mike Toyon sent up a picture on the Twitterverse about a astrobiology field location of interest. Mike, if you could put that up. A lot of you got it right. It is indeed the clouds of the planet Venus. Venus is the second closest planet to our star, a little bit further in than we are, about the same size, but all of its carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere as opposed to Earth, where a lot of ours is actually locked up into rocks. This large amount of CO2 in the atmosphere causes a massive greenhouse effect, and we'll talk about greenhouse effect on this show as well. So huge shout out to all of you who got it right, but the winner is uh, Laz, who is the husband of Rachel, Destroyer Worlds, that's tweeting at as at Lazarum Terror. So everybody is a winner this month. Uh, the, 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 the winning material has always been our wonderful astrobiology graphics novel, but I don't have a bunch of it at home here. <laughs> and so uh, we'll send it to you as soon as we can, but, uh, but we have a surprise for you because they are all available for free online. So Mike, if you could put, put up the URL of all the, uh, the, the location of these astrobiology graphics novel, they're written by Dr. Aaron Gronstahl and they are fun to read for people of all ages, so I highly recommend them. We also give a huge shout out to one of you who's been tweeting our show. This show could not be possible without your support, and many of you are helping us advertise our program <coughs> to the broader online world. And uh, this month's Ambassador of the Month, I'm very pleased to announce, is Burfin Formaldehyde. That is tweeting as at Burfin Space. Thank you so much, Burfin, uh, for your support. And thank you for all of you out there in the Twitter world and the online world who are helping advertise our show. If you have any questions during this program for, my, for uh, our guest, Dr. Colin Goldblatt, please add them in the comments. We're currently live on Saganet.org as well as Facebook Live. Uh, and I wish you all uh, a wonderful show. So without further ado, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce Dr. Colin Goldblatt, who is a professor of all things atmospheres at the University of Victoria in Canada and a good friend of mine and uh, Colin is wonderful to have you on the program. Thank you for coming. Hi Sanjay, thanks for having me on your show. So like I like to do in this program is turn back the wheels of time to begin with and uh, try to figure out how what, what happened to, to turn you into the wonderful scientist that you are today. Is it something in your childhood that occurred or... Yeah, so I guess we probably both started at high school and my favourite subjects there were, um, were geography and, uh, and physics. So, you know, geography was really all about looking at the world around us and trying to understand what was happening and why. And then, of course, physics was, was using, those, those, you know, using the techniques of physics to do that. And then I, you know, I also started, I guess, when I was a, a kid and a teenager to start liking going into the outdoors, starting going into the mountains when I was a teenager, and really observing the world outside. Um, and then I think my interests were, um, you know, in the physics of how the world worked. And then I grew up a bit and started realizing that chemistry and biology were quite important too, somewhere, somewhere through my training. Um, and that's got me to where I am now, I think. 
So you, you, you grew up in the UK, so you went to school in, in, uh, in England. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your academic path. Like it's what I discover when I talk to astrobiologists is not a single one of us has the same academic path that leads us to be an astrobiologist. So I'm very curious about yours. Yeah, absolutely, Sanjay. So I started off at the University of East Anglia in a geophysical science program, and then I metamorphosed into a new degree they had there called Meteorology and Oceanography. So I was studying the physics of the atmosphere and ocean, and I was kind of all lined up to go do a PhD in physical oceanography, and and then I had this last-minute you know, change of mind, and I thought, well, what was it that I came into this at the beginning to try to understand, and that was how did our how did our world all work to, together? And I, um, you know, when I was a teenager, I'd read a little bit about something called Gaia hypothesis, which we'll talk about later, and I remembered about that, and I ended up going into a PhD that turned out to be about the evolution of Earth's atmosphere. Um, so it was really a, a shift from physics to try to understand how everything worked together on our planet. That's fantastic. The evolution of the atmosphere is, is an incredible topic because it's not you cannot understand the evolution of the phys of the atmosphere with physics alone, right? Because biology has played such an important role in shaping the planet we are today. And so in your day to day life now, you're a professor at the University of Victoria. Tell us about that. Absolutely. So, you know, there's a few jobs of a professor, you know, probably about 15, but, the, you know, part of it is teaching and that's a, a great opportunity to share the science and share the, a research-led view of how to view the world um, to our undergraduates and, of course, to my, to my graduate students and, and then doing research about atmospheric evolution and you know, of course, doing our part to keep the university running. Um, so, so that's a, a really nice opportunity to, to keep doing science and you, you realise it's not all doing research. That's a, a small part of my job right now. You know, everything else takes up the rest of the time. Um, but, you know, really facilitating other people to have that understanding of, of how our world works from, from the point of view that I've learned. So what you're doing these days is you're using your background in physics and mathematics to write computer software that simulates the physics of the atmosphere on our planet, right? Yeah, and that's absolutely part of what I do. You know, there's, um, you know, my work's got the, an element which is about the climate evolution of Earth and also about the, the chemical evolution of the atmosphere. So, you know, one of the things that we can do is if you take a column of the atmosphere, we can calculate the radiative transfer through that arbitrarily well. And, you know, if you know the atmospheric composition, you can, you know, radiative transfer physics is one of my expertise, and we can, we can do that job really nicely. But then you need to know the atmospheric composition, and we don't have good models for how that's changed through time. So that's one of the things that I, and I know you as well, Sanjoy, have, uh, have worked at quite a lot is trying to understand what our atmosphere's done and how it's evolved. Um, yes. So that's a fascinating topic, and, and are we gonna, are we gonna get there, guaranteed. <laughs> so radiative transfer, of course, is the, is the mathematical formulation of energy from the sun coming in and how the planet keeps it or reflects it out. And that's all very tractable with the tools of physics. Now, if we go back in the early Earth, which is a time period that you and I both enjoy thinking about, and by early Earth, I not, I not, not mean you know hundreds of thousands of years ago, even million years ago when the dinosaurs were around, but billions was a B years ago when the planet looked nothing like it does today. So Colin, I wish you'd take us in the time machine, dump us in this period of Earth called the Archean before two and a half billion years ago. If we had a breathing mask, what would we see? What would, we, what would the world look like then? Absolutely. So let, let's talk a little bit about the atmosphere then. If, you know, today our, our atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen and some important trace species and, you know, minor species like carbon dioxide and some water vapor. But all those things in our atmosphere today are really biological products, or at least they're strongly uh, modulated or controlled by the biology. So we have to think of 
how that has changed to Earth history. So let's go back to the Archean. Well, the thing that we know we didn't have in the atmosphere was any oxygen. You know, the, the air we breathe today, which is 20% of our atmosphere today, in the Archean was probably about one part per million in the atmosphere. So that's about the same as methane is in the atmosphere today. So why is that? Well, oxygen is a biological product. It's made by oxygen-producing photosynthesis, which is the most amazing advanced metabolism. This is where uh, we see it today in plants, but we'd also see it in the Archean and cyanobacteria eat photons from the sun. They get their energy direct from the sun, split water, use carbon dioxide, make organic matter, make energy, and then oxygen is the toxic byproduct of that. And in the Archean atmosphere, there wasn't much. And then the end of the Archean was when oxygen built up in the atmosphere. There's a very fast transition to you know, probably percent levels of oxygen that we call the, the great oxidation. And after that, the oxygen started rising. There was the biggest climate upheaval that we've ever seen, right? Absolutely. So at about the same time as oxygen rose, we moved into something called a snowball earth event. And how that happens is, well, there's glaciers at the poles of the earth and it gets a bit colder and the ice line starts to move nearer and nearer the equator. And that's a bit like leaning back in a chair. You lean back too far and you fall over. And in the same way, the ice line creeps towards the equator. And then when it gets into mid latitudes, we're reflecting so much energy away that the whole planet gets glaciated. Um, the absolutely biggest climate catastrophe that we've experienced on Earth. Not the worst that could happen, but the worst that we've ever experienced on Earth. So the, the Archean was a time period where the, the, the sun was fainter, because we understand the physics of the sun as well. And so we can predict using the computer simulations that the sun was fainter back then. And so to keep the planet warm, there needed to be some greenhouse gases like methane you're talking about and carbon dioxide. So this rise of oxygen, this oxygen kind of started eating up this, this, this methane, which caused the, 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 the uh, greenhouse cover to, to collapse. Um, and so hence the snowball earth It's just, and, and, and yet these poor microbes didn't know what they were, do, what they were doing, right? So, but, but yet we do, we know what we're doing with our atmosphere and yet we're not doing anything, which is driving me crazy. <laughs> so can we learn from our ancestors, right? You know, I think one of the things that we can, you know, we're in a time of unprecedented environmental change at the moment. The, the rate of change now, because of human-caused carbon dioxide emissions, is faster than almost anything I can think of in the geologic record. The last good contender is 60 million years ago for anything as fast as we're seeing now. And looking at paleoclimate is really important in terms of understanding what can happen. And what we've seen through the past is, is long periods of climate stability and then periods of rapid change to different climate states. Yeah, so, so oh, I was going to say, like the Earth has seen climates much different than today. There was a point in the Earth, like you mentioned, that was completely covered in ice. There's been a time period where there was no ice on the surface, right? Yeah, but, absolutely. So we, we, we do have climate change. We see that right through the geologic record. If we look at other planets, we see even weird and, and, and wackier climate. So we know that change happens. So one thing that we do have now, which is, uh, which is a really interesting evolu uh, evolutionary innovation as far as we know, is that we actually know what we're doing. Um, so my colleague David Grinspoon calls this planetary change of the fourth kind, is we actually know what we're doing and we can make choices to change it. And what that is going to require is collective action. And you know, these are very difficult times at the moment, but something that gives me great hope is seeing us taking collective action. We can see a global threat. We can see something that could hurt ourselves, hurt our family, hurt members of our community, and we're taking action. 
And climate change is just the same. We need to take the kind of collective action that we're taking now to slow down this epidemic. And we need to take that kind of collective action to slow down climate change. And we can do that. What's happening now has shown that we can do that kind of collective action. I couldn't agree more. And in fact, if you if you kept the climate change action going in in you know, I'm exaggerating obviously here in, in, in billions of years in the future, as I mentioned, the sun in the past was fainter, is actually getting brighter. Earth might turn into a Venus, right? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things I love about planetary science, and I'll, I'll go back to the story of my academic path here, is um, I worked on um, Earth's evolution during my PhD, and I worked on the problem of the Great Oxidation. And then we, we got to the you get to the problem of you've only got a sample size of one. And this was really pointed out to me by one of my PhD advisors, um, Andy Watson. And he's now talking about how important looking at other planets was. He had training in planetary science and, and the question of astrobiology. If we want to understand Earth better, we need to look at the other planets. And of course, the way we can understand the other planets is by understanding Earth. It's a, it's a beautiful cycle there. Um, so Venus is, is Earth in the distant future. Earth is, you know, Earth is this wonderful habitable planet. We've taken most of the carbon dioxide and locked that up in rocks. Biology has been really important in doing that, in, in building carbonate rocks. But you get to a point where the thing called a runaway greenhouse happens is you're getting more energy in from the sun than you can possibly get out from an atmosphere like Earth's atmosphere. It's like turning the tap from the bathtub up, but only having a small plug hole and turning the tap right up. Eventually, that bathtub's going to overflow, and that's going to happen on Earth in um, you know maybe 500 million years and a billion years, and that is really going to be. The end of the the end of the world. The run, the apocalypse is going to be a runaway greenhouse, lime kiln, inferno. <laughs> and what that means is that all of we're going to start warming, and then all of the oceans will eventually evaporate into the atmosphere. And then the greenhouse effect is going to be so strong that it's going to bake off all the carbon that's stored in limestone at the moment. Then we'll have all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere too. And then over a couple of hundred million years, we'll lose the water vapor by hydrogen escape to space. And then we'll end up like Venus. <laughs> wow. That's, that, that's quite the, the, the future. Um, so those of, those of you who are watching, please don't forget you can ask questions. So if you're on Facebook Live, just use the, the, the comments down below to ask your questions. If you're on Twitter, please use hashtag AskAstroBio. And if you're watching on SegaNet, uh, please use the chat there to ask questions. And it's a wonderful conversation. So this is a show about astrobiology, Colin. And I was wondering, when did you discover the, 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 the discipline of astrobiology and how did you tailor your science to that discipline? So I guess somewhere during my PhD, I, I found it by accident because I was, you know, working on the early Earth and there wasn't that much of a community in the UK doing that at that time. It wasn't very well funded, but it was getting funded through the NASA exobiology and astrobiology programs. So if I go to conference sessions, the people I was talking to were were people in the US funded out of the uh, out of the astrobiology programs there. So that's why I went to talk about my my science and uh, you know astrobiology meetings, including the astrobiology graduate conference, which is I think why I met you, Sanjoy. Yep. Um, and there's just a it was a great community and a very friendly community of people working on these questions. You know, if we understand early Earth and all of the evolution of Earth, it's like watching a feature-length movie rather than just taking a snapshot of Earth now and saying that's a habitable planet. So I like you, I, I study early Earth and I, when I'm discussing my, my science, the public, they tell me like, who cares about the early Earth? Why is that even important? And so the answer is always in the astrobiology field because the early Earth is the most studyable planet that we know was alive that's not our modern world. Do you share these thoughts? I think so, yeah. I think the Earth gives us just so many 
different samples of what a planet could be like. And I actually think in the astrobiology community, there's a little bit of a, ten, a tendency to simplify it. This is what the Archean was like. This is what modern Earth is like. And actually, there's this whole smorgasbord of climate and atmospheric composition that we don't really understand very well. And I actually think when we're able to observe other planets, you know, a lot of other planets, not just our solar system planets, but whatever it is, we've got really good instruments to look at the atmospheres of of many distant exoplanets, we'll find that our imagination was not sufficient for what a planet could be like and what a habitable planet could be like. So if you had extraterrestrial astronomers that were looking at Earth today, but that were also looking at Earth a very, very long time ago in the Archean period, what would be the differences that they would see and how could they tell that the planet was alive? Well, it would depend on what instruments they had, of course. So um, the, the easiest way probably to tell that the Earth was alive today would be to look at the, the radio wave leakage that we've got. We've been broadcasting television and radio for the last 50 years, and who knows what other things we're, we're broadcasting accidentally. So you can listen into that. You could just you know, point your antenna at the planet and... and uh, watch the six o'clock news. So that would be a good way of telling that we're alive. But if you go back more than 50 years, that's not an option. So you've got to look at the atmospheric composition. You know, the atmosphere is really part of the on Earth. That's a bit of theory that dates to the Russian geochemist uh, Vernadsky, writing about 100 years ago. And the biosphere is having living parts and that you and I and the plants sitting behind me, but also non-living parts. You know, the atmosphere is part of our biosphere. And change the atmospheric composition. We put it into disequilibrium. And that was a, a very important observation by James Lovelock when he was working on the Mars program, that you can look at a planetary atmosphere and say, how did that get like that? Okay, that was just photochemistry. Or you look in Mars and it's like, well, that's pretty near thermochemical equilibrium. It's just like if you left it for a very long time, it's how it would be. But you look at Earth and it's so weird. You know, we have methane at about a part per million when we've got 20% oxygen. And that can only last 10 years if you just left everything alone. So there's got to be a constant source of both those gases. And that source is life. So you look at the atmospheric composition and then you say, can we explain this any way other than by the, by the action of life? And if you can, all well and good, and if not, well, that is your tentative detection of life on your planet. But it's all about looking at the atmosphere. So we can't think of modern Earth independently of life. Like Earth would look nothing like it does today without life. So, I mean, oh no, no. Go ahead. If, 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 for everyone who can get to a window and look out of the window, you're seeing the evidence of life right now. You know, I'm looking out at the, you know, the plants in my garden. You know, I the atmosphere with its composition today. It's all about life. You know, I have absolutely no idea what Earth would be like today, what our atmosphere would be like without life. So all the gases that we breathe that are in our atmosphere are completely cycled, well, not all, but most, are completely <laughs> cycled by biology, right? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And of course, the exception are the noble gases like argon. We don't think life has anything to do with them. But uh, oxygen, we've talked about, you know, the carbon cycle where all life is, you know, is carbon, has got a carbon-based metabolism. So we're using CO2, we're putting it out again. The oxygen, of course, is linked in with that carbon cycle. And even the nitrogen, you know, something that both you and I have worked on, we've we know there's a cycle of long-term fixing of that nitrogen by biology as a nutrient, and then some of that fixed nitrogen get, can get cycled through the rocks and out again. So absolutely everything has got the, has got the fingerprint of biology involved. Yes, and that's why I find it so interesting, because it's 
it is so complicated and yet so revealing. Because I think that, like you mentioned, uh, the, so the earth has changed over time and studying it over time gives us a snapshot of a different planet that could host life. But that's nothing compared to the diversity of of planets that are out there. Um, so as, 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 as you know, there have been thousands of planets that have been discovered outside our solar system. Like, what do you think the future of, of, of exoplanet science and, and early Earth science uh, have in store? You know, I think looking a long way forward when we've got instruments where we can really start to probe the atmospheres of exoplanets, that is going to be a, a revolution in our understanding. We're going to find... I mean, the, the emphasis in the astrobiology community is, are we going to find life? Are we going to find a, another Earth-like planet? And the field's going to grow up at some point, and people are going to start to think, how can we characterize the whole range of atmospheres of other planets? And I've got no idea what we're going to find, but it's going to be fascinating. I don't know if we'll have those instruments in... Um, within my career. I know some of our colleagues are working really hard to, to make sure that we do. Um, and then, then we're going to see a diversity of planets and we can start to see what are the properties of planetary atmospheres. And then one of the things we'll see is what is the frequency of planets that we think have life on? We'll find out whether life is a rare phenomenon or whether it's a common phenomenon. And that new bit of understanding, I think, is going to really change the way we think about absolutely everything. I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, yeah, the question of whether alone we are in, we are in the universe is, is one of the, the biggest questions we could ask ourselves as a species. But beyond science, you're an avid outdoorsman. Uh, you, you, I think that's a way you can clear your head from, from, from academics and also get inspired to do science based on what you see. What are some of the outdoors activities that you're involved with? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for asking. Get out into the outside. I think it's, uh, you know, as someone who have that quiet time, time in just beautiful places in nature. So, you know, my my long term hobbies have been um, have been hiking and have dangers around the world. Um, you know, my I, I live in the Pacific Northwest uh, at the moment, so the Olympic Mountains are some that I love. You know, I go to the Cascades sometimes, and and our island mountains here. I'd like to, you know, as much as I can, go backpacking where I can be self sufficient for four or five days and just be out there and. Uh, listen to the marmots call to each other from different mountain peaks, watch the bears wander past, and just enjoy that, that quiet time outside. And then um, living here in Victoria, where I do, the easiest way to get outside is, is in a sea kayak, uh, where we've got a beautiful coastline. It's, uh, I live 15 minutes from the beach in four different directions, I think. So... Um, <laughs> We can get out kayaking on the coast of British Columbia here. Um, so there's really good opportunities to, to be able to explore this incredibly productive ecosystem here in the Pacific Northwest, the one where we can still see what it was like before the, um, you know, the European, uh, you get a glimpse of what it was like before the European invasion here and see what, an almost pristine environment was like. And the beauty of the, the scientific background is you can read the landscape, right? And you can understand the mountain here, why not? Why there's a lake here, why not? Why does this, is not, this rock is all polished and so on? So that's going to be really rewarding. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a really lovely opportunity to be out, and especially when I get to go out with anyone you know, from another branch of the environmental sciences. And, you know, I get to hear how they understand the world too. That's always a, a really great pleasure. 
Wonderful. I, we could have this conversation forever, Colin. This is really wonderful. But we're gonna we're gonna have to end here and start one of my favorite parts of this show, which is the Q and A. So uh, thank you all for those of you who have sending questions. There is a bunch. I hope we can address all of them. Um, but we'll do our best. Uh, so the uh, so here we go. So uh, sending your questions, and the first question is by uh, Graham Lau, my co-host here at Ask an Astrobiologist, who asks on Twitter, if life is common in the universe. How likely do you think we are to find signs of alien life, biosignatures or technosignatures, in the near future? Oh, um, well, let me get my crystal ball out there. Um, I th I'm going to call the near future, um, as someone who works on geologic time, I'm going to call the near future within my lifetime. Um, and I think that's all going to depend on what we invest in the instruments to um, to detect these things. So if we're if we're willing to detect uh, to invest in instruments, then we've got a, a fairly good chance of finding finding something. I think life probably fairly common. I'm going to guess one in a one in a hundred planets might have life on. I'm going to call that common. So if we can. Uh, sample a few hundred planets, I think we've got a fairly good chance. I love that optimism. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, next question is from Brant Dettering, who asks on Facebook, what would the indicators of life on Earth be from the perspective of an exoplanet? Mm, absolutely. So if we look at Earth right now, we will see that atmospheric disequilibrium. So we talked about the idea of um, the, the oxygen and methane together. We could also, as I said, look at the radio signals. And this experiment has actually been done. When the, um, uh, I believe it was the Galileo spacecraft was, was leaving Earth for the outer solar system, it did a couple of gravity assists around the Earth. And so this is for Cassini, not Galileo. And there was an experiment that was proposed by Carl Sagan, which was to turn the instruments on and, and and point them at Earth and say, can we detect life on Earth from a spacecraft? And there's a beautiful paper in the, uh, it was in, I think, 1992, where, where Carl Sagan said, well, yes, we can. And it's radio signals, it's atmospheric disequilibrium. Very cool. Yeah, it's a phenomenal paper. Uh, the next question is by Astrobiology Club on Twitter, who tweet as at AstrobioClub, and they ask the following. Given that our industrial activities are altering the makeup of the planet, do you think the effects of a global p pandemic like the one we're having now will be something that future will future people will see in the rock record? You know, I don't think what we're, we're seeing now is big enough to, to be preserved in the geologic record. It's, a, it's going to be a very important event from our society. And I think there's going to be a lot of societal change after this, but I don't think it's enough to see in the geologic record. I think humans overall, we're now imprinting something that, that will be in the geologic record. Um, but a little bit of a change in our trajectory, I don't think it's going to be able to be preserved in the rocks. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Thank you. Um, the next question is by Andrew Planet on Saganet, who writes, I wonder if the carbon dioxide clouds of Venus, as an example, would tend to rule out life initially evolving on Earth in the same atmospheric circumstances in favor of atmospheric water vapor on Earth as the main greenhouse gas as a precursor to life evolving here initially. Yeah, so I think we, let's think about the let's think about the early Earth when 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 life evolved. We have the we're going to start off in the Hadean uh, eon, which is the, the eon of formation when um, you know Earth formed as a planet. It would have had, started off very hard in a transient runaway greenhouse, and then cooled from there. So we'd have had a, a water vapor atmosphere, which would have then condensed out to to form an atmosphere which I think has got to be not too different from ours. You know, there's going to be a hydrological cycle. There probably won't be carbon dioxide clouds. It just probably wasn't cold enough for that. Um, so we start in, a, in an atmosphere that's not too distant from ours, maybe warmer, maybe a stronger greenhouse effect. But, you know, we've been a, 
different planets have uh, cycles of different gases. We have a hydrological cycle on Earth because of the temperature we're at. On, uh, on Mars, which is much colder, there's carbon dioxide con uh, condensation and and then if you go out to Titan, you can get methane condensation. But we're here on Earth in the realm where water is the main species which we can evaporate and condense. Thank you, Colin. The next question is by Serhat Sevgen, who asks on Saganet, is there any possibility or idea covering life that could have started in Earth's atmosphere? Like we think today of Venus atmosphere that could potentially sustain life. You know, that's, a, that's a, a really difficult question. I, I don't fully know the answer. I think some of the things we do know is that surfaces are really good for helping chemical reactions to occur on. So if I was to think of where I would start life, it would be, you know, on mineral surfaces, you know, in, in fluids. The atmosphere wouldn't be the first place I would think of looking at. Now, the atmosphere is full of, you know, life today, spores being moved around. So it, it's part of the biosphere, but it's not where I would think of to start looking for, for the genesis of life. Thank you, Colin. Good question, Serhat. Uh, next question is by Jacob Hakmisra, who is asking on Twitter as at Hakmisra. What do you think of the Gaia hypothesis? Is it scientifically useful or merely a poetic device? So the so Gaia hypothesis originates from, from James Lovelock, who was actually my PhD advisor's PhD advisor. Um, and that is to propose that life on Earth has regulated the climate and chemistry of Earth through Earth history, that this is a that four billion years of habitability hasn't happened by coincidence. It's happened because life has been uh, dominating our, our chemical and climate evolution. And the way I think of that now is to think of Gaia as a name for us. It's one of the names for our biosphere on Earth, recognizing our inhabited planet as a coherent entity. So I would describe me, you, Jacob, the plants outside, even the coronavirus as part of Gaia. We're all part of one global ecosystem where everything affects everything else. So in that sense, you know, Gaia hypothesis has been, is fundamental to my thinking of thinking about the single planetary entity. But there's a question of has, has, it, has life controlled? Well, yes, it's controlled, but has it regulated um, the evolution of our climate? And I don't know the answer to that. I think that's, for me, one of the most fascinating open questions in planetary evolution. Yeah, well, regardless of whether the Gaia hypothesis is correct or not, I think it has really pushed the scientific community forward in thinking at all the interconnections between life and the planet it lives on. So yeah. in, that, in that sense, I guess it's, it's, it's been uh, very useful. Uh, th the next question comes from Marianne Denton, who is asking on Twitter as at Astralimno. She's actually quoting one of your papers, Colin. Oh dear, <laughs> I did not ask the thing. <laughs> and she asks, uh, Colin, can you please elaborate on, quote, existence of oxygenic photosynthesis is not sufficient condition for either an O2 rich atmosphere or presence of an O3 layer, unquote, based on your article, by stability of atmospheric oxygen and the great oxidation. Absolutely. So, so this is work I did, do you know, uh, about 15 years ago, and the scientists in the room will appreciate this, this comment, I hope. I did the work 15 years ago, and I still think it's basically right. Um, so what I did was model uh, an Archean biosphere and said, well, that biosphere is going to be putting out its waste products into the atmosphere. The atmosphere is really just where we, the, bios, the biosphere throws its waste gases, and oxygen being one of them. And then we looked at, well, how long will that oxygen survive? And, you know, well, in the Archean atmosphere, not very long. But once oxygen levels creep up, you get enough oxygen that the atmospheric chemistry starts changing. And you, there's enough oxygen 
to start forming ozone. So oxygen is the O2 molecule, ozone is the O3 molecule, and we, we understand O3 formation by something called the Chapman cycle. That chemistry was written down in the 1920s and 1930s. And you need enough oxygen, you need a big enough atmospheric column of oxygen to start forming ozone. And when you form the, that ozone layer, it's a brilliant sunscreen. And as well as helping stopping us get sunburned when we're allowed to go outside, it also changes all the atmospheric chemistry. It slows down all the chemistry because UV is really important in doing that chemistry. So once you build an ozone layer, it means that oxygen can build up. And that's the great oxidation. Um, so we call it a bistability because you can have two different stable states, that low oxygen state without an ozone layer and a high oxygen state with an ozone layer. Um, but if we just tweak the parameters of that model, if we believe the model represents the real world, we could keep going for quite a long time without an ozone layer and then without oxygen at much more than a part per million level. And that would make it really difficult to detect. So that's a really big challenge in, in exoplanet astronomy is the idea that you could have a biosphere humming away, producing oxygen, but you wouldn't be able to see the signs of it because it would be too dilute in the atmosphere. Thank you, Colin. Uh, next question is an excellent one by Avril Wang on Facebook. She asks a question that I would have asked you, Colin, had it not come up. So thank you, Avril, for asking it. And she asks, what are some tips you have for undergraduate students who are interested in going into astrobiology? What, what should we do if there is no undergraduate program for astrobiology? Well, there are undergraduate programs for astrobiology at every university. They're called chemistry, they're called physics, they're called earth science, they're called uh, biology, they're called microbiology, they're called oceanography. If you don't do some science, um, because if I'm looking for a, uh, a graduate student who I want to join my group, they're the, you know, I'm looking for them having done a science degree where they got some of the relevant science for me. That, that's, you know, usually for people working in my groups, enough math, you know, some programming, um, ideally some atmospheric science or some geology. So do something you're passionate about right now and then get research experience, you know, and it really doesn't matter what that research experience is in, but I'd like to know that you can do something. You can actually go and do research. So see if you can do an honours project or get a summer research experience as an undergraduate program. I did one of those uh, with the whole oceanographic institution in in physical oceanography. Um, so, so just get active, do science, do research, and it will flow from there. Yeah, I agree. What makes you an astrobiologist is the questions you ask, not the science you do. So, uh, so yeah, keep your mind open and, and pursue what you love, Avril. That's, that's the most important part. Uh, the next question is by Prita Jaipal, who asks on Saganet, what are the chances that a planet hosting multicellular life could be lacking in oxygen? What gases could be a replacement? Could there be another mechanism similar to photosynthesis? You know, I have absolutely no idea. Um, Great and, question, Peter. And you know, save that question up for when you've got a microbiologist on the, on the show. Um, you know, one of the things I like uh, you know, working in an interdisciplinary field is just being able to say, I've got no idea. <laughs> and that's that's perfectly okay to say such things. Um, Christoph von Kauenberg on Saganet asks, what would be your biggest dream come true in the field of astrobiology? That is, what do you hope will be discovered more than anything else? Oh, um, so I think for me, it's um, it understanding what the population of planetary atmospheres is. So I think that would be, we need a big telescope where we can look at the atmospheres around a lot of different stars. I'd like a population of at least 100 different Earth-sized planets and be able to see that population because I think 
statistics of a population is going to be the thing we will learn most from. You know, I've heard stories from, you know, some of my uh, some of my senior colleagues from when I was at NASA Ames talking about what it was like when we were exploring the outer solar system. And we found things that we never expected to find. And you know, just and that exact same thing happened with the recent mission to, to Pluto. We all thought Pluto would be really boring. I had no idea why there was a mission being sent to Pluto. And then we get images back, and there's this incredible geology going going on on the um, on the on the surface there. When I was first shown the the images, I was just absolutely amazed. And I'm like, okay, Pluto's not boring. So that same thing is going to happen when we look at new things. We're going to find things we never imagined. Very well said, Colin. I couldn't agree more. The, the next question is by Tom Caruso, and it's fairly long and there's not much punctuation. So I'm going to do my best, Tom, and hopefully we can capture it. It seems Earth became more likely to support the, 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 the development of advanced life as geological activity mellowed down and Earth climate changed. At one time, icy moons and planets would have resembled water worlds at further distances from the sun. So if we try to model the early atmospheres of young, warmer, wa warmer water worlds, they are currently ice, that are currently as ice covered. Are there similar similarities for life bearing possibilities between outer water worlds and younger Earths in the habitable zone? Mm, so there's a couple of things there. So let's pick up on a couple of the ideas there. If we've got this idea that we that that we need things to be just right, just like Earth is to have like life on Earth, you know, and I'm not sure that's true. I think that's a little bit uh, that's a little bit focused on. We know, you know, we know how things are. So things must be just like this. And, and I disagree. I think a lot of volcanism actually puts a lot of, you know, fresh material into um, into the biosphere. You know, it puts a lot of chemical gradients in which life can exploit. And, you know, Earth is actually one of the most volcanically active planets in the solar system. Not the most. That's Io, a moon of Jupiter. But we've got a lot of volcanism going on here. So I think that's probably good for life. I don't know whether it's essential. But then let's think about parallels between Earth and, um, and some of those icy moons. So Earth, we're just around the triple point of water. And that the triple point is the, the temperature and pressure condition where you can have liquid, solid, and gas of water vapor. And then let's go way out to Titan, uh, a moon of Saturn. And it turns out that the, the surface conditions there are pretty near to the, uh, the triple point of methane, the temperature and pressure conditions where there can be uh, liquid um, gas and, and maybe not solid methane. But um, so the physics we see in Earth's atmosphere, we see the physics be just the same, but with, with methane instead. So, you know, you get clouds of methane, rain of methane. So you look at different planets and you see just the same physics going on. So I think that's one of those really useful comparative planetology things that we can, we can pick up. What do you think in the solar system are most likely habitats for biology? Oh, that's a great question. So, I mean, all of Earth, of course, but that answer is, is cheating. We know there's life <laughs> absolutely everywhere on Earth. Um, Titan I'm fascinated by, where if there's anything completely different and weird, that, that you know, Titan is a, would be a great place to look. It's something that makes me, and you know, any of the icy moons, actually, where you've got some geology going on under the ice, that's one of the things that makes me a, a little worried about some of the exploration that is going to go on of those icy moons, putting instruments right on them, the risk of contamination. I would probably rather wait, we, we rather we waited another couple of hundred years or so until our science got better and we could actually understand whether there's life there. So, so Earth first, then I'd go to icy moons and look for something totally different. Very cool. 
the next question is by Gaurav Yadav, who on Facebook asks, does the atmosphere of a planet determine, or rather can the atmosphere of a planet determine the presence of life? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways to have an atmosphere, you know, go wrong. So on Venus, you know, the atmosphere has, it's a, it's a post-Earth planet and it's, it's just too hot on Venus for there to be life on the surface. You know, it's not excluded that you could have life um, high up in the clouds, but we've, we've, got no, we've got no idea. So, so something like that, you know, you can get too hot, you know, that's a problem. If you get too cold, it's going to mean that life is going to just be really, really slow. Will it be able to keep going? Could there be life on Mars? We've got where, where the thin atmosphere, it's really cold. We, we don't know. So you need an atmosphere. You know, and why the atmosphere is important is it determines the climate. And, you know, we think that we want a, a kind of medium-ish temperature for life as we know it. But then, of course, what about life as we don't know it? I was going to ask you, do you think we could detect life as we don't know it? I think that would be a test of our imagination. I think the, the, the idea of life detection by atmospheric analysis is very general. It's looking for signs of disequilibrium in the atmosphere. Um, and that should work so long as life is working quicker than the photochemistry. And that probably is required for life. So I think using that very general tool of analyzing the whole atmosphere and then trying to understand it is our best hope. Yeah, I think I agree that chemical disequilibrium is probably a universal sign of something weird happening on that planet where that something weird could possibly be life. Yeah. <laughs> now, the Actually, let's talk a bit more about that because chemical disequilibrium really is a marker of photosynthesis. It's a marker of life using energy from, from the sun or from the planet star, and then it creates that disequilibrium with that free energy that it's getting from the, the sun. So if you think about very early Earth, before we had photosynthesis, when now the biosphere that was just using the chemical gradient in the environment then life would reduce the amount of disequilibrium. So there's probably no way of finding a planet where there isn't photosynthesis. Oh, that's provocative. <laughs> um, our next question is by Patty Hernandez on Facebook, who asks, why might planets circling M dwarfs be good locations to search for the evidence of life? Mm, absolutely. So uh, an M dwarf is something that's called a red dwarf star. So it's a, it's a star that's smaller and less bright than the sun. And then a planet, which was to be kind of the same temperature of Earth, would have to be orbiting much closer to that star. And probably so close that it would always, the same side of the planet would always be facing the star, like the same side of the moon always faces the Earth. Now, what the advantage of that is for astrobiology is because the planet is near to the star, it's very easy to observe. We can observe it as it goes in front of the star, what we call a transit, and then we can see, we can measure the, the sun's rays, the, the star's rays that have gone through the atmosphere and how they've changed as they've gone through the atmosphere. That's called transit spectroscopy. So I'd say the good reason to look at um, planets around end dwarfs is because they're really easy to look at. And then when, the, when or if the James Webb Space Telescope ever launches, it is going to be the best instrument to look at those. And, you know, really that's the only thing we should be using the James Webb for is looking at planets around M stars. And then we can start to build up a bit of a sense of what the population of their atmospheres is like. Um, so this, this tees off really well the next question by Pritha Jaipal on Saganet, who asks, how do we detect the composition of atmospheres on planets far away? Is spectroscopy the only way? Uh, 
with present technology, spectroscopy is absolutely the, the only way. So what that is, is looking at what wavelengths of light get absorbed in the atmosphere. So we know what the, we know how much of each wavelength of light that a star is going to emit. And then if we let that light come through a planetary atmosphere, so when that end dwarf planet, for example, is going in front of its star, we look at the light that's come through the atmosphere there, and we look at that with our telescope, we can see what's missing. And it's a little bit like, you know, reading a barcode. There's different lines that different gases will absorb, and it'll be able to tell us which gases are there. So that is absolutely our top tool. Cool, cool. Um, so we're really running out of time, Colin, which is really uh, disappointing. So I'm going to give Graham the last question here. And he asks, um, a very good question. Thank you, Graham, for asking it. Given the current state of world affairs, are there any positive messages you perceive from the realm of astrobiology that may help our communities across the globe weather the storm? I think one of the important things that we get from, from astrobiology and all, all planetary science, and even you know, deep time Earth science, is a sense of time and a sense of perspective. You know, we as humans are part of the biosphere. We're not something separate from nature. We're part of it. And we're actually very smart. You know, we can figure out what we need to do, you know, in these very challenging times to make ourselves and our families and our communities safer. But also as we move forward and we, we take this energy, we take what we've learned about communal action and apply that to, to climate change and biodiversity loss, we can do those things. We can do that communal action. And I think the sense of perspective that we get from looking at the other planets is um, something that, that we can all take forward. And one great thing we can do is anyone who's got a pair of binoculars at home, if you look at, look at the moon tonight, there's a beautiful crescent moon, look at that with your binoculars and you can see the beautiful relief on the craters of the moon near the Terminator. So you can look at another planet tonight. So do that, get that little bit of a sense of perspective and then channel that energy into communal action to make us all safer. I couldn't think of a better way to end this episode, Colin. This has been an absolute wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you, Sandra. It's been so much fun. For those of you who are watching, uh, thank you for sticking around. And we really look forward to uh, you uh, being with us next month. Keep in mind that uh, NASA has a bunch of tools provided for educational mater uh, materials and activities and other fun videos uh, for folks of all ages uh, while you are stuck at home. And the website for that is science.nasa.gov slash get dash involved slash NASA at home in one word. So folks, wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please continue to be active on social media, helping us spread the word about our program. And until then, stay curious. We'll see you soon. <laughs>